Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are going to be learning all about Rappi Blog today, which is a all new Perl based blogging platform. How new is it? Just released to CPAN today. So, regardless of anything else, this is the newest blog platform for Perl. I can say that with confidence. <laughs> Okay, so first, a little background, a little bit about me. My name is Henry Van Stein. I'm Van Stein on the interwebs. Uh, I'm the owner of IntelliTree Solutions. We're a small uh, programming shop. We develop database-driven web applications for our clients using mainly the RapidApp framework, which I'm also the main author and maintainer of. And I'm also a, a contributor of both, to both Catalyst and DBIC. And um, I've given demos about RapidApp um, for the past several years at uh, YAPC, so now TPC, um, which have been, I, I'd say, pretty well received. People have liked them. But one limitation of the demos that I've done uh, so far in previous years is that they're just that demos. There are hypothetical applications built just for one purpose, to demo some feature of RapidApp. And there's certainly lots of other more sophisticated complex things that we do in our own real applications that don't aren't shown there. So for this year, I wanted to find a topic, a demo to do that would be a bigger real world app that's real world useful rather than just a, um, a toy, basically. And so I married this with solving another long term to it that I've had that I've wanted to do, which is make a better blogging platform. Now, you may ask, well, another blog, why another blogging platform? Well, there's different reasons, and different people have rationales and have different, different aspects of what blogging means to them and what features are um, most important to them. And I won't get into all of that. I will say RapidApp is already well suited to the problem domain, but obviously I would, I would say that. But <laughs> you, can judge, you can judge for yourself in a few minutes. But um, the number one reason that I decided to go down this road for me, was to have a better way of handling the front end APIs, the themes, the, as they're called in other platforms, which give me endless grief and what I ultimately wanted to fix more than any other single thing. So what is the problem with themes in other platforms? Well, first of all, the word itself implies restrictiveness. It's changing the appearance. You, get, you have an opportunity to change the appearance of something that's already defined. The back end already tells you, here is the structure that we're going to be. Here is how we're going to do um, pages and structures. And you have, to, you have to adhere to that. And then all these, these platforms, they invent their own concepts of pages and sections and subheaders and all these different things that you have to learn and adhere to. Um, custom uh, URL endpoints. All these things are assembled in a domain-specific manner that you have, to, um, you have to learn their platform just to get to the most basic things, uh, including areas where I feel you shouldn't have to, to do that. Um, and the biggest gripe for me is trying to work with designers. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever worked with designers. They know HTML and CSS. You ask them to give you a design. They give you back a nice static HTML site that works great, but then it, you have to now interface that with the domain-specific model for whatever platform you want to interface. So like that's where, you know, typically, if you want to design for WordPress, you want a designer that knows WordPress. Otherwise, you, as the developer implementer, are taking their stuff, chopping it up, putting it in, you know, and then there's, they include some crazy JavaScripts that conflict with the main system's JavaScripts and all of these things, and it just becomes a giant um, ball of misery. So. For Rappi Blog, I have a different approach to how the front end environment should work, and I call them scaffolds. And this is just a term that I chose to give more emphasis than the word theme to um, explain that uh, the scaffold is basically an ordinary, regular HTML site first, and is able to handle its own rules and businesses as much as possible it is able to, to make its own decisions for the front end and not, so the back, I don't want the back end to get involved in things it didn't need to be involved with. Because by the way, HTML already has a lot of features, right? You know, we, there's, we don't need to re-implement all you know, kinds of um, constructs and paradigms that already are, are built and work. So 
what makes this work is that it lives at the root, the scaffold lives at the root of the site like HTML wants, which is, and that's sort of the biggest blocker of these other systems is you know you have controller actions and they dispatch they dispatch templates from some other directory and then they assemble these things together to then present this site that has relative paths and whatnot and that that generally is not going to fit the same as it was created so these so my idea was I want to have a regular site but then be able to selectively have template directives. Like you can just drop a static site in, but then when you want to call to the back end and, and utilize those things, you opportunistically are able to do that. But it can still just be a regular HTML and just work. That was the main uh, principle. So then the back end API exposes um, APIs and methods and directives that the scaffold can use however it chooses to do it, and then there can be different, the scaffold implementations can be, the front end implementation can be completely different from one site to the next. So the basic architecture um, is we have this scaffold directory, which is, uh, again, a public website structure. You have your native HTML, CSS images, alt fonts, all the stuff you would have, and then you can have these um, template directives are also then available. And then it, those template directives call to a template API, which then expose blog-specific directives to be able to do blog-specific things, which reaches into the back-end model. And this is where we do prescribe. It's not until we get to this layer that we establish rules, which is a rules for the taxonomies, the posts, and how we're going to store things. We obviously we, we define it at this layer, but then make it so that there's multiple ways that this, the front-end scaffold can access those features. And then um, for modification, for making changes, like creating posts and doing those sort of change operations, that's where RapidApp is re really comes into bear, where we're able to utilize the advanced um, capabilities of RapidApp for those sort of things. So let's um, start by having a look and seeing one of these sites in action. So I'm going to start with a running site. I'm going to go through some public, the standard public facing functionality to see how it works, P browsing posts, pages, searching, et cetera. Um, then we'll go into the password protected area, um, make modifications, um, editors, basic admin. Then we'll browse the scaffold and see how these scaffolds are actually built and um, with time show how to create a new site using the create script, which is very, very fast and easy. Um, okay, so Let's start. So the point that I wanted to accomplish is that you can make any HTML um, that you want. However, that said, it does ship with some pre-built scaffolds, which are well, both to give the ability to get quick out of the box ability to get a working site, but also as a, mainly as a reference implementation. That's the best way to see how to implement these things is having some example scaffolds that call into these features that can be used as a reference. So this, this is the default scaffold that ships with uh, Rappi Blog, which is called Bootstrap Blog. And it's just the, it is the most vanilla you can get. It's the Twitter Bootstrap um, Blog example. Like it's just directly from the Twitter Bootstrap Blog example. So it's like plain vanilla. So um, the sort of concept of a blog and there's different ways we might want to display information, but we're going to have you know basic stuff. We're going to display posts. Oh, and by the way, I need to thank Fru for contributing um, his own blog posts from afoolishmanifesto.com, which, by the way, is an excellent blog, especially if you like Vim, like more <laughs> Vim information there. <laughs> so thank you to, to Fru for letting me um, uh, use this to populate some sample data here to use. So, you know, what is the blog going to do? We want to have, you know, have posts, access posts, right? We want to be able to have listings of posts. We want to be able to maybe have paging. Maybe we want to be able to control the items per page. Maybe we want to control whether we're going to have display being um, verbose or concise and have toggle options, paging, forward page. We want to be able to you know, display paging information of what, you know, items per page and, and that sort of standard stuff. Um, 
So the model supports basic taxonomies so far. I've just basically implemented tags. Uh, and you can, we can like look at the list of tags and it shows the number of popularity. Uh, we can filter items according to that. We can look at authors, for instance, and see articles by different authors. Um, ban basic sort of standard stuff. And then of course we can search. And, and find, find our, our posts, right? So now let's say, so that's you know, basic stuff. This is not rocket science. So now we wanna, we wanna create a new post. So when we create a new post, now we're gonna get into the territory where this is pr um, predefined, because it's a predefined set of, um, of data points that our model declares. So we can, um, we have, I have a new, new post link here, which calls in to open an interface, and automatically if you go into a, an area that's password protected, it'll prompt you to be password protected. All that happens automatically with Rapid App. And this takes us on through, and now we can create a post. So these are the basic fields for our post object. We have a name, which is, needs to be unique and is um, used to generate the URL. And then a friendly title. Um, we have a concept that the model defines of a per post image, which doesn't, the scaffold doesn't have to use this, but the data points are available, and in some cases you want to do that. So you can select an image to be associated with, you know, an image to be associated with the post. Um, All right, this is um, the summary, basically, which is another concept so that you can have the, um, the preview summary of the post. You can either type in your own custom or it'll auto-generate it from the, from the beginning of the, of the post. And you can select the date and time. You can select the author if you're an admin. Obviously, if you're not an admin, you, have, you can only post as yourself. But, and again, it's the, the, the robust permissions model that exists. We have standard concepts like uh, published, unpublished. Obviously, they won't, it won't show up if it's not published, but that's a way that you can preview things. So then when we get down to actually writing the body, and this is where, um, and this is a new feature that's sort of been added to Rapid App as a new editor type, um, which is rich content. So uh, static-only sites have gotten particularly popular with programmers, with devs. A lot of people here probably have static site generator blogs where you write your blog post in a markdown file, you generate the site and you push it up, and that works great, um, but business people aren't gonna do that, lay people aren't gonna do that. So I wanted to be able to provide an interface that lay people could use, but then also not go down the rabbit hole of all the problems that arise from that with WYSIWYG editors that create this mucked up HTML that, is, that causes all kinds of issues. So, um, this is a, um, we like that we, we definitely like the markdown format for storing the content. So we are writing our posts in markdown, but so this, this sort of looks like it's a WYSIWYG editor, but it's actually a hybrid WYSIWYG editor. As far as regular Joe user who doesn't know the difference, you know, they can add a heading, they can add uh, maybe a numbered list. I just am a bad typer. And I'm typing fast. You get the point. Why does it have to be spelled right to understand the code <laughs> principles? Right. Um, well, I I make I make predictable typos. Is that what that shows? Um, so. And so that's it. So look, it acts like a WYSIWYG editor, but what it, it's not actually a WYSIWYG editor. It's just a syntax highlighter. And is what it's doing is it's highlighting Markdown syntax. So you just type you just type Markdown syntax, and it sort of renders what that's going to look like. Um, and then one of the other cool features that we have here is you can do a side-by-side -side preview to see more closely what that H the HTML is gonna look like from that. Now the styles, this is a, a preview preview where the exact styles are gonna depend on the styles of the scaffold as it renders, but the basic, the basic ideas of what it's gonna look like are there. And 
support for um, content. We want to, let's say we want to insert an image, we can just drag the image in and it just works. And this uses, this is actually some of the capabilities that have, this is where we're leveraging RapidApp. This is, RapidApp has what's called a simple cast store, which is a, basically a database that stores content like, exactly like Git does. So it automatically provides deduplication. So like this hash that it creates here is unique. If I, if I add this same file over and over again, because the content is the same, the checksum will be the same, it'll be that every. I think what just happened is you uploaded that file. That's correct. Yes, that's correct. What happened there was a round trip. Yeah. Yes, yes, a round, yeah, a round trip happened. It did an upload, it finished the upload, got a response back from the server with a link to be able to get, get to it, and it put it there. And then also, by the way, it's, notice here, um, in case you're wondering, I'm dropping in actual HTML style image tags instead of the markdown style image tags. And the reason is, is the markdown images, the f support for flexibility is pretty low there. So, like, I, and I also have this here, so it's easy to do something like, like that, and it'll do what you want it to do. So, um, you, add, you know, and there's other other cool stuff, and it's all live side by side, like tables and 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 so you know, you know, as developers, you know, you're just writing Markdown and it's just text, and you know that the text is going to not be something crazy on the other end. But then the business users, they don't know the difference. They think they're using a WYSIWYG editor. So I think it's pretty cool. This is based on an editor called Simple MDE, which is uh, it's a heavily modified, obviously. Um, but I think that it's pretty cool, and I hope I'm looking forward to seeing how, how this works for real users. Okay, so we add our features of what we want. We're good with it. We save it. It um, creates the post, and then it brings us to a post page. And what this does is this gives us an actual preview of what it's going to look like on the site, and it uses an iframe to do this. And then we can, we can re-edit it if we want to change something and save it round trip, and, um, and there it is. And then we, we can see the actual markdown that it is, um, which is how it's actually stored. And then we also have a tab for additional attributes where we can set things, we can change our post image, we can change our author, we know, and this is all bound by what permissions we actually have. And, and we can, um, we have a link, we can jump straight out to the actual post there. Um, and it does session tracking. When, and, and the, the scaffold can choose to do all sorts of things. Like you may want to have, you may want to have an edit link on the post. And so you can do that. Another site, you may want people to log into the admin section to go and do it. But for this example, I have lots of examples for things. So you can click edit to just jump straight back in to edit it and save round trip. But again, these are decisions that are up to the scaffold that can do it how it wants to. Um, so some other, capabilities that we have, so also um, I mentioned published versus unpublished. Um, if it's not published, you know, it'll tell you that it's not published, but we can still see, we can still see the view here. And actually now if we view it, oh, public, whoa, no, why is it still displaying? Well, because we're logged in. If I log out, page not found. You know, I log back in, it takes us back to where we were. And that's another thing is that um, all, all of the all of the API calls that the template directives give you are all one let web 1.0 concepts. Like if you if you that doesn't mean that you can't have fancy crazy Ajax front end stuff happening because that's you know by definition if you can do you know if you can do web 1.0 you can do web 2.0 with your front end stuff. But it's sort of trying to get to the least common denominator ability. So it tracks and redirects any page that you're on. You can go, you can log in, log out, and it'll redirect you and, and keep your namespace um, in place. We have other basic capabilities um, that, and again, some sites might not use this, like you might just use discuss and not have comments. And then if you don't want comments, just don't put, just don't put that in the scaffold. But if you want them, you know, you can add uh, comments and multiple comments and you can reply to comments, and you know that uh, just works in a, in a generalized way. Right, right. But I can make it so, and it, and it warns you. See this little red right here, and that's also the choosing. That's the the template is choosing to say that it's not public. But we better fit. What do you, what do you say? We fix it so that it is public. 
Hmm? Well, it, or if you choose to, I mean, you, when you create a new post, when you, now it's there, now it's public. When you create a new post, you can choose to, to start it off as published if you want. There, now it's, it started out as, as public and it's already there public. So, um, basic capabilities, basic features. So, this is one of, this is one of the, the scaffolds. And again, um, this is the, the main purpose of this one is to, as a reference implementation. It's like these are the basic capabilities that you might want to need. You, but you're, the, the idea is that you're not stuck with this look at all. You put in any, you go and you drop in any, heck, you could do a, um, a wget-m mirror, download some, any site, github.com, and, and if anybody uses wget-mirror, we'll let you copy, you know, it'll follow links and get you the whole working site. You can take that, drop it into the scaffold, and it'll just work. And then you can go in and you can selectively add in directives to start making it dynamic. And that's another thing that I wanted to be able to do is to be able to incrementally improve and get to things. So it's like, okay, here's a known starting point. Here, my site is working. Now I want to add this feature. Now I want to add, add that feature. I don't have to learn all of the API just to get to Hello World. I learn the API to add the features that I want. So I'm going to very quickly show you another. So there's two scaffolds so far. I mean, this is very new, obviously. Um, and I want to have, and the plan is later to have much fancier, better scaffolds built in. And that'll happen through time. But as of right now, there's two that are built in, the b default one. And then I have another one which shows another way that this can work. And this is based on another just open source um, a static HTML site that you can download called Keep It Simple. Um, and then this site, this one decides to do things in a sort of a different way. So like we have a concept here, like oh look we have an avatar, which the other scaffold didn't choose to, to, to access that, and this one does choose to access it. And we have a, a drop down list. Um, and the other thing is, is that then this is, these are these interfaces that we've been calling up, but this is still, the model is all driven by RapidApp. So we have access to the um, RapidApp backend, and when you come back into the interface that you may be familiar with, and I just added some nice tiles to just have shortcut links to some common things, like you can see your posts and all posts. And then because it's RapidApp, you can, you know, you can customize your view and add filters and, and save them and do all the stuff that RapidApp lets you do you can do that stuff. You can do that stuff here with your um, your post database, and and then if you double click, by the way, if we now we, if we double click to open one of these rows, we'll see aha, this page that we've been seeing here is actually just the row page that we set up for the for the post object. Which, if you're familiar with RapidApp, you've seen RapidApp before, you know that you can define um, custom interfaces on a per result source basis. Um, no, let's see. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it's, it's searched, it filtered it down, so. Well, you can, I, I would, I, I would. Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, it's just it's just doing a, a, a string, an any string search. Okay. All right. So, um, moving along. So, questions to, up to this point. Correct. Right. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And that is a difference. And also, so, um, you know, there there is not there is no single thing that is all, that is the right for everybody. Um, and there are other reasons. Part of the Part of the reason that this is a, da a full database-driven backend, as opposed to a, a you know leaner, more modern text-only backend, is well, it's RapidApp, and RapidApp does databases. So come on, what did you expect? <laughs> but also because that um, it's trying to target these business people as well, and then also you have the ability because it's, it's RapidApp and all this is modular, is you can build an application uh, around this, which is a, a useful thing. Correct. So the audit entry, would that be 
Yeah. Right, and that, so I have I have a um, a um, DBIC train, change tracking thing called called Audit Any, which I'm actually planning on providing some automatic ways to implement that that'll automatically do change tracking of, of, of rows in there. But yeah, that's the that's sort of the benefit of the benefit of using a Perl and DBIC and this robust stack is this power, these powerful rich capabilities that we have. And that's what sort of what I really like about what Rapid App does is that it reaches into this incredibly powerful stack and brings these features forward to, to leverage to all sorts of things. Okay, so we probably want to actually see how this thing works in the back end. All right, so, um, so Rappy Blog is a subclass of Rapid App Builder, which means that it's a, just a PLAC PSGI app. So if you're familiar with PLAC PSGI, um, it's the standard thing with that. It has very, very simple options. Here is an example app.psgi for building uh, and running um, an app uh, of this. And um, there's just a couple options. There's site path, which is a, the directory where the site lives, which is used for data persistence. And it automatically, uh, Rapid App automatically sets up the data storage, which is both the database and the cache storage um, is automatically set up. And I should point out that with Rapid App and DBIC, you can have whatever backend you want. You can make it a, a Postgres backend database. However, you have to do more configuration, obviously, to get to that. All that stuff is there, it's all modular. But out of the box, um, out of the box, by default, it's gonna do a SQLite database so that it can just live in the local directory and it'll automatically set all these things up for you. We'll see in a minute. So the, the uh, again, database files are created automatically. If it doesn't already exist, it automatically creates it and deploys it. Uh, and then the scaffold, the other option is the scaffold path, which is the path to the scaffold that we've been talking about, your document root, which is the, the literal root of the site. And it'll, this will actually default to a directory named scaffold inside the site path if you, if you don't def define it. So back to these scaffolds. Again, it's an ordinary directory served from the root of the site, which literally means like a, a directory uh, IMG and the file foo.png will literally be served as IMG foo.png. And then it, what, what, it, the namespace with the app guts is automatically merged so that they are able to live in the same way. And the other way that, the, the way that other platforms do this is they proper, properly segment the controller namespaces, but then you run into all the problems that I talked about in the beginning of when you try to make an HTML site live where it doesn't think that it wants to live, then you're, you're putting everything uh, back together. So again, with, if you use no configuration, it's just a static website. You can do that wget-m and just drop a site in. Um, and then the, then the files can be TT, and we use template, the templating engine as we're gonna see in a second here is template toolkit. Um, but then there's also, the scaffold has the ability to define a configuration to tell the back end how to use it because it's all well and great to have the site be able to just be static, but then there are certain cases where it needs, you need to specify how it's gonna function, like how, how, are the, how is the post gonna get displayed through a wrapper? That's, those are things that the config is able to talk about. So, the, but the important bit is that with this design, it's the scaffold, it's the front end that tells the back end what to do, not the other way around. So let's look at the uh, scaffold uh, YAML file, which uh, is a, a, a file named scaffold.yml in the root of the scaffold directory. Here's an example with a few of the basic options Static paths um, are these are these match prefixes of URLs, and this just says these aren't templates. And this is mainly about um, performance. Don't try to evaluate template directives if you don't need to. You know that you're not going to evaluate images as templates. Private paths, which any of these things should not be served publicly, because again we have this this merged namespace, and this is not really about security, but just about cleaning your namespace and not serving things that you know aren't, you know, aren't appropriate to, to serve. Basic things, default extensions, so that if you have a 
uh, files, uh, foo.html, you can access it as just foo. A landing page, you know, these are things that you need to, you know, determine with a static site. You have to, you have to literally go to index.html or whatever. You want to be able to go to slash, where does that go to? Be able to define a, a custom 404. And there's some, some other options, but sort of basic things like this. And by the way, I will mention, I'm proud, very proud of myself. I spent a lot of time writing the pod and there is and documentation on MetaCPAN. So, you know, it's not all complete, but it's there. All the scaffold options are, are documented. And then we have these view wrappers, and I'm not going to get too deep into this, but this is the mechanism of how posts get rendered. And it's basically a way of declaring, the scaffold declares, um, I own this path. In this case, um, we'll say, I, I want this wrapper, I have this wrapper named uh, post.html in private. I want to use this wrapper for anything that, that, any requests that come in into the post namespace. And it just append, and then it appends the name of the, takes the name of the template, sticks it on there, and then renders it wrapped by the named wrapper. And that's the sort of the base, the nomenclature that it uses to do this rendering. And there's actually, um, some sophisticated stuff with this. You can do all sorts of things. There's different types. Include is one type. There's also um, insert, which are template TT directives, and it's is, again it's described in the pod. All right, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at the, these actual site f files. So, um, so here's the the demo site that we've been looking at. Here's the, our site, and um, we see we have a. We have our app.psgi, which is there, like we saw. We have our scaffold directory, and these other direct, these files, these databases, and the cast store are just automatically created by this being the site dir. So then let's look in the scaffold. Again, it's just an HTML site, but they're template enabled. Let's start by looking, let's look at its scaffold config. So we see these are the, some of the options that I just, we just talked about. And then there's more options down here, and you're like, hey, wait a minute, I thought you just said that you weren't gonna have configurations relative to page structures and whatnot. But aha, it's not. The scaffold can use its own config to do its own thing. So, and these examples are just set up to where, to define some navigation, the scaffold config is a place to store data structures that your scaffold can then use. Um, so we have, you know, as I mentioned, it's a literal, these are literal paths. So um, under the scaffold, authors.html, if you go to slash author in the site authors, that's the file that it's, that it's gonna be loading to. Um, and like we see here, this is, this is if you're familiar with, with template toolkit, this will be familiar to you. You see, okay, we're using a wrapper, site wrapper. You could just, this could just be a static HTML file, but that's, you know, that's not that, that useful. So it's sort of the standard, the standard conventions of, of template toolkit. So if we look at the site wrapper, this is just the main, the main common um, HTML wrapper. And we see we have things like for, um, we're doing, we iterate over the scaffold.pages. So the template API exposes these variables in your template namespace. And you can, um, you can do things like the scaffold is a reference to the scaffold config. So that's how we're able to, we're able to iterate scaffold.pages and there's that data structure. And that lets us then build HTML out of that. And part of the reason that we're then doing it this way is then we can implement things like like, well, if I, if I click around and see which one is the active, see how the active link changes, sort of a basic navigation capability. This, that's the, the implementation of how this particular scaffold accomplishes that, a tab row of navigation and highlighting the active one, which again is not the only way, you know, there's a million and one ways to have a site layout itself. That is accomplished entirely in the implementation of the scaffold, which is, is right here. There's also, unfortunately, I'm not gonna have time to like dig into all of the awesome stuff of the API that I think is really cool that I did. I will d dive into just a couple things. Um, the, the list of templates where we have the paging controls and whatnot. What, there's a common, um, common set of, 
of accessor methods in the template environment that you have. One of them is list posts. And this is a, a call that can be made in any context, in any place, to bring back a list of posts that you can then iterate to display in any sort of way that you want. And it also gives the ability, it also gives all the metadata necessary to do paging, to know where you are, to know how many items are in the set. And again, this is all documented in the pod, but it provides ba the basic four paging controls, which are next page, previous page, last page, first page. And if you look um, how this is working, this is a query string that's happening here. And is what this does, and I'm going to be getting a little too into the weeds, but just to explain, is that you can pass a set of params that can be a query string set of parameters. You can pass it into this list posts method and get back the set of posts that match that. And then it'll send you back metadata that you can use to navigate around. And some of the metadata that it gives you back is it gives you back first QS and prev QS. And is what this is, is that is the query string, the parameters that are necessary from where you currently are to get to that object. So that's how it's able to get the next page. Like if you look at, it's probably too small to, for you to be able to see, but it's just generating that on the fly to, to be able to navigate around. Now, on other sites, other sites might not want to do that kind of paging or do it at all, but it just provides a way, and again, part of the reason that it's done here in this way is to um, show examples of, of how things can be done so that you can use it as, as a reference to do things. Um, questions so far? You could not directly in this, however, you could easily, because it's all a standard conventions of DBIC, um, you could uh, absolutely write a script to do that. And you're, you're just calling, you know, the um, DBIC search, find the row object, call update uh, to change it. And you could certainly do any of those things because you have a full rich back end. But it doesn't, there isn't any out of the box feature to do that. But I mean, it doesn't really need one because you can implement that yourself absolutely so in fact here so let's let's, 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 let's look at Fru's CSV databases in Perl we can edit it and again we weren't logged in so now it's going to ask us to log in I keep missing hitting in so we it brings us into the internal secure area of the page and we can click edit and now we can change it to something else and we can we can totally screw with Fru's post and make it something ridiculous. It was it was this professional thing. It was this professional thing about CSV. And now look we put Cartman in there. So <laughs> does that answer your question? Other questions? Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm actually making great time. Okay, so getting to this is actually really, really fast and easy. The, um, once you install the package, you know, cpanm, rapi colon colon blog, it ships with a utility script, rabl. And we can call that with, right now there's only one, the idea is this is gonna be a utility script that will do lots of different things, but right now it only has one mode, which is create and then you just supply it a directory name that either doesn't exist or is empty. Enter, and then it's gonna say, okay, which, we'll bootstrap it with one of our built-in uh, skeletons. Which one do you want? You can do the default one, bootstrap blog, or the, or the second one. And the idea is hopefully there's gonna be lots of these later on and they'll be bigger and better and more awesome. Um, but for now, they are simple, so we'll just, we'll leak. Keep it the simple one, we'll just hit enter, copy those files in, 
you have an opportunity to set the password for the admin user, or you can just leave it blank to be the default, which is just P-A-S-S. -S, but you can set it to something if you want here. And then you can even, if you want, you don't even have to exit the script. You can, act, you can say, do you want us to start it, the Plaque server right now? And I can just give it a port, and it'll start it up. And it automatically deploys this first time. It just created all the databases, deployed them, set everything up. And now, what port did I just do that on? So now, if we go, he always wants, actually my plan, my plan is to have a Plaque Wizard app. And then you start it, and then you can actually de de deploy it through, though I didn't have time to do that. But, so okay, so here we go, you know, no post published, you know, brand new, so we can, Log in to the interface, and of course something's going to not work. Oh my God! See, you know, I just tested. All right. Well, it's. Well, I don't know where that could have come from. Yeah, that should be fine. Well, I, obviously, there's a bug, so this is the first version of this. All right, and it won't let you recreate it again if it's already. I added, I added some last minute security, which is probably, there's a bug in that. Oh, I already have something running on that port. Yeah. All right, so I have a I obviously have created a bug, which I don't know how I just did. Who was, who was I sitting next to where I just tested this before I came in here? Okay, well, it, it, all right, well, it works. And whatever bug it is, it'll, it'll be fixed. This is the first release today. Um, but one of the things that I was going to show is we have the permission, permission model. We have a user, the user database. Um, for our users, we have some basic permission flags. We have um, admin, author, and comment are the three permissions that we have now, which should be self-explanatory. You can comment, you can create posts, and admin, you can do um, anything. And um, so I don't know why though. So the other, let me let's see if the next one works. So the other thing that you can do is you can set this up with Docker um, as well. And uh, uh, this is, um, Rapid App has a Docker image that we distribute, that I talked about last year called uh, Rappi PSGI. And is what it actually does is it's a Docker container that's designed to run any Plaque PSGI app by the, that has an app.psgi file in its directory and then you mount that directory on um, on opt app and then if it finds an app.psgi in opt app it'll start that up so then you can you can bootstrap this and I have what five five, five minutes Um, so we can run these commands. And then actually start the app up and then we can run our create script and we can do it on, uh, do it on opt app. That's what you need to do it on opt app. So this time we'll use that one, I'll do a password this time. It's just a warning. OK. 
Okay, so, and now, with, and you can, you can read all about um, Rappi, .psg, Rappi slash PSGI, it's available on Docker Hub, and it has, it has some basic control things. You can open a shell, you can exec to a shell in Docker, if you're familiar with, with Docker, and then you have some basic commands that you can run. App restart, we'll start the app up, and now we can exit out of that, and I think we just put this guy on Yep, all right, so let's, fingers crossed. Okay, now it's working. Well, this one's working. So there must, there must be a bug in the deploy without specifying a password. So, but it, it works. So you just specify a password. You, you want to specify a password anyway, rather than using the default. So, you know, now we can, we have, here we have a, you know, brand new blog, it's empty. Go into maybe the admin area, or we can just new post. Make our new post. So yes, we want it to be published. Scroll stuff in here. And now if we go back to our blog. Now here's our our view here, and we can we're logged in. Leave comments and do stuff. Reply to comments. All those different capabilities. Oh, one thing that I think that I forgot to mention is that the there's only basic taxonomies so far, uh, which are tags. And the way that right now the way that it does tags is you just specify a tag Twitter style. So hashtag keywords. And then it, it'll parse, it parses those out of the body. And then you see that it has, I don't know how well you can see that, you can see the, the post. Oh, another thing that it'll do is some basic things that the model does is it does, it has this hit tracking concept where it will, and the scaffold needs to call this. You have an option that you can call in the scaffold record post and it'll record a hit in the hit table so that you can, like you see this one has already three hits and these are actually records the HTTP request. And then you can do things with that. Um, you can let's go back to the first do this example. You can look at, um, you can do things like see popular posts because you can then sort by that, um, that relationship, which again, this is back to um, what Rapid App can do is automatically you have your relationship columns and that automatically renders as a count of the related items. And so then you can automatically sort on that, and then there, you, and with the paging stuff, say give me, the give me four, sort by popularity, give me the first four, and now you can populate a very simple section for most popular posts, which this one's apparently most popular through testing. Um, so again, the lots of information on the uh, pod online. Again, you see, see how fresh and new this. Mm -hmm. So we have um, basic usage. There's a, a manual, which has one section which talks about the scaffolds, which you can read, and it'll give you a listing of all the different template directives that you can do. You have this list posts method, and there's a similar method for list tags, list users, and it follows this list API, which is a, re, a DBIC result set class component that gives you this unified interface and gives you back the result. It gives you back this, all this meta information for uh, uh, your sets so that you can do, like that's how it did, for instance, that's how it does the, the, the paging controls. And it gives you all kinds of other information, how many, are, how many items are before this page, how many are remaining after this one, what the current limit is, start, end, all sorts of information. A lot of information that you could, you could calculate yourself um, you could calculate yourself, but why, it just makes it easy. So that way you're, try to make it easy on the scaffold to be able to access these, these capabilities. So I'm just now at time. Are there questions, more questions?
So that actually one of the one of the features that I would, we do not have yet. So actually, I should go and talk about the final. I have one more slide actually, which is the f future features, which is I want to support multiple content formats. Right now, we're just doing the Markdown HTML, but there's actually guts to do um, this in a generalized way. We expand the database model to have more concepts. Again, the model is very lean right now. The only the one taxonomy. Add um, more more scaffolds, more features. Comments right now. The mode that you have is you have it has to be a user with the comment permission to comment. And I agree, anonymous comments are a useful thing. It's one of the things that I want to add. I'm planning on adding that as an option. And my plan is basically provide an option in the configuration that says anonymous comments, um, yes or no, and then have it either automatically inflate an author object. And then there's different ways. There's different ways to go about doing that. And part of the reason it doesn't do that yet is one of the other things that I want to do is I want to have better, more, more better authentication. You know, third part, sign in via GitHub, sign in via Twitter, OAuth, um, CAPTCHA. You know, like if you're going to allow anonymous, as soon as you start allowing anonymous comments, you want to be able to make sure that bots aren't going to spam you. So, you know, be able to do password resets, uh, self sign up. These are things that I'm planning on adding. I should point out that you, you absolutely have the ability to do these things already because it's, it's a very, very modular system. Everything's modular, everything is separate, but that said, I want to provide the sort of on a silver platter features to get to more to more things. So, but to answer your question, right now, only authenticated users can post comments. Yeah, so there is, there is a big, that's a good question. The question is, is, there's a big dependency chain to install to install this. Um, yeah, this is based on RapidApp, and RapidApp is based on Catalyst, and Catalyst has a bazillion dependencies. Yes, that is true. From a brand new, fresh system with, no, with nothing installed already, it takes about an hour from CPAN. And CPAN has a tendency of sometimes being broken. Like, there'll be one thing will just will be broken, and your stuff won't install. And so that's why the answer is that the recommended supported way to do it is to use Docker. That's why the, the Docker... Um, You call uh, Docker pull Rappy PSGI. That gives you a container that has the full stack of everything installed that you can you can run out of the box. So that's the fastest way. And this is, by the way, this page right here. This is something that anybody could do to run this set of commands and get a blog running, whether they've never used Perl before, whether all they have to have is, is Docker installed. And this takes, you know. Um, a minute. Well, you saw how fast I did it. It won't be that fast because it'll have to pull the image. I already had the image full. But that's that's the official answer to get Rapid App quickly is to use the, the Docker image. Other questions? Pulls up the blog fastest. Well, you can. Because it's rapid app, you can dive into, let me go back, yeah, so if we go into, ever, if, if you browse the database, all of these are related um, information. So comments is a related object, and you can sort by that, and you can follow these relationships and see, like when you when you type in just those pounds, it actually it inflates on the back end. It creates rows. It creates creates the tag if it doesn't already exist, and then it creates a post tag, which is a link between that, that tag is a many to many, and puts that in there. And all that is available to you for doing searches. If you this is probably new to you, I uh, I recommend look at some of the previous talks on Rapid App where I go into all the capabilities of you can have query builders and you can build out any kind of query that you want and you have the ability to do all of those criteria. And that's, by the way, another benefit of doing it in a database versus just doing it in files is that you have those relationships and joins and foreign keys and you're able to um, you know, explore your data to a much more powerful level and that's one of the benefits of RapidApp. Any other questions?
So, so the question is, how easy is it to add another attribute to the post? So that's a very good question, and I haven't fully decided on the best way to handle that. So there's two ways that I'm thinking about approaching that. One way, one way is you can, you can define your own model. So you can define your own post model. You can extend the post result class and add additional, um, add additional columns. And by the way, it's all, the system is already forward looking for this scenario where it'll, automatic, it'll automatically deploy, if the database doesn't already exist, it'll automatically deploy if you have additional columns. And then those additional columns will, will show up automatically. But another safeguard that it has using another tool that I wrote for DBIC called um, Schema Diff is it verifies, every time it starts up, it verifies that the deployed schema matches the schema that you're using. And if it doesn't, it gives you an error. So this is already forward looking for not only the ability not only the ability to specify your own models, have them work, warn you if you have a mismatch situation, which you can easily shoot yourself in the foot in that scenario if it doesn't do that, and then provide a way to do schema upgrades later. Because as it goes forward, we're fully planning on supporting the current version of the database into the future. So we will use probably Fru's deployment handler, um, which is another great package to bring, you know, to do um, incremental versions forward of the schema. The other way is creating a meta, a meta column, a, a meta field is what I was th thinking about doing. And I want to I want to add a JSON editor, editor type to have these attributes, but then there's challenges with that. You can't search, you know, if you have, you have attributes serialized in a blob of, uh, of a column, you know, a meta column, you can't, you can't search on that because it's not a column like, you know, in relational databases. So there's sort of trade-offs there. I haven't decided exactly what the best way to hand that off is. But I've thought, of, it is thought of, am planning on doing that, and part of the reason for right now, for this version, the model is very lean. The, the taxonomies are just this very simple model, even though there's more that would be wanted. This is, this is an initial version, proof of concept, to get this, to, to, make, to keep it very clean and, and, and raw for this starting point, and then be able to carry that forward. I'm going to start. That's the other reason that I wrote. I don't have a blog, so that's really the, the, here's the biggest irony. I have no blog. The reason I needed Fru's posts is I don't have a blog because I couldn't. I just couldn't bring myself to do it in WordPress or to do it in something else. And so, like the only way that I was going to get a blog was if I wrote this myself. So that's part of the reason. So I will. I am in the coming days, weeks, months. I will have a blog. Will be up. Now I just have to get content there. I actually have a designer. Actually, part of the. Pro the background here, I have a blog design that I paid a designer to do, and then I was like pulling my hair out trying to get the HTML implemented, and I was like, no, there has to be a better way to implement arbitrary HTML from designers, and so that's why I, that's, that's part of what made me do this. Um, over time, if there are other questions, see me after. Thank you very much.